All right, it is 1110. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Active Transportation Symposium panel called Connecting Places, Implementing Access to Transit. Uh, we're excited. We have a lot to share with you today, uh, so we're going to get started. My name is Shannon Simons. I work at Caltrans in the Division of Rail and Mass Transportation. Before we begin, I want to quickly point out some of the Zoom webinar features. So um, all of the participants are muted and your video feature is turned off. A quick reminder that this session will be recorded. We have an hour and 10 minutes for this session and we plan to leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, following the presentations for a Q&A session. And we really do encourage you to ask questions throughout so that we have those at the end. Uh, please ask those questions in the Q&A widget, not the chat widget. So if you have any questions um, in the chat, they will not be read. The chat's only for if you have any sort of like technical issues in which you need to reach the meeting producer. So again, at the bottom of your screen, please input all of the presentation related questions in that Q&A widget. In addition to, uh, there's a feature in the Q&A widget rather in which you can actually upvote questions. So if you have the same question as someone or you're really interested in having a specific question you see answered, please upvote it. And the questions that have the most votes will be the most likely to get uh, asked and answered first. So we have five speakers today on this panel, including myself. So I'm gonna go through some quick introductions. Again, I am Shannon Simons. I'm a senior transportation planner at Caltrans in the division of rail and mass transit. And speaking with me today is my colleague, Henry McKay, uh, also a transportation planner at the division of rail and mass transportation. Then we'll hear from Joanne Parker, who's the Programming and Grants Manager at Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, or SMART. Uh, then we'll hear from Paul Martin, Active Transportation Manager uh, at Mark Thomas. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Destiny Thomas, an anthropologist, planner, and founder and CEO of Thrivance Group. If you want to know more about any of us, you can read about our bios on the Active Transportation Resource Center Symposium website. So with that, let's get started. Henry and I are going to kick it off with our presentation. So I wanna start with a brief overview of the California State Rail Plan, which provides the statewide context for the work that Henry and I do and identifies the opportunities to strengthen the rail and transit network with active transportation connections. So our team writes and updates the rail plan every four years and acts as the framework for guiding both state and federal investments in rail and inner city bus over the next 20 years. We focus on service driven planning, which allows us to make really strategic and, and efficient investments in infrastructure by first intensifying the utility of our existing rail rights of way and then phasing investments to scale to meet service demand over time. So the rail plan vision is based on these three core principles. So first is that it's an integrated statewide network. So this means integrating high-speed rail, inner city and regional services with integrated express bus services. Second, the rail plan is oriented around coordinated schedules. So we uh, design the entire state network around this regular pulsed service um, at key transfer hubs where core services are pulsing into and out of these main hubs on regular clock face schedules so that it's really intuitive for uh, a rider to know when the trains and buses are coming. And then it also makes public transit connections a lot easier because local transit agencies can tweak schedules to make sure you're meeting the more infrequent long distance services at these core hubs. And then finally, and really importantly, is that the whole rail plan is designed around the customer focus. So this means also having the seamless first and last mile access into and out of the state rail network, um, integrating your ticketing functions, and then making sure that all of what we're doing is both auto and air competitive in terms of time, cost, um, and comfort. Next slide. So I know this looks a little abstract, so let me quickly explain. explain. So what this uh, graphic is showing is a statewide um, integrated network of services. So this is basically all the counties in California, roughly in, from north to south. And on the left side there in the teal, you see that we have the 2010 base year showing trips made between the county pairs. So this is an aggregated data uh, and the line width indicates the more trips between those county pairs. So on the right side of that image, you see the 2040 ridership growth between counties if we build out only business as usual. So growth largely accounted for by population growth only. Um, if you click again, Henry, 
now you can see on the right side of the right map is showing the potential ridership gains when we integrate these services. So this means physical integration, schedule integration, ticketing and trip planning integration. And not only are more trips made between those existing pairs, but new trips are made uh, between counties that were previously unreachable by rail or transit. And then by integrating the first and last mile connections with feeder transit, as well as bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, we're only enhancing this. Next slide. So bike and pedestrian connections to transit and rail are an often overlooked piece of the multimodal puzzle, but inviting cyclists and pedestrians to the stations is one of the easiest and the most affordable ways to extend the rail system to that first and last mile. Uh, we, we have started referring to bikes and, tra and transit as um, the allied modes because they're spatially efficient modes that when used together really enhance the functionality and reach of the other. So for example, I say, you know, if you build a bike lane, a mile of a bike lane somewhere, you will get a mile of mobility, which is great. But if you're building a mile of a bike lane connecting to an inner city rail station, you are providing hundreds of miles of mobility. And so much of the work to integrate bikes and trains at this point has focused more on getting bikes on trains. So we've made great strides in this area, especially in California, but, you know, there are trade-offs and we see entire train cars uh, dedicated to moving bikes around when we could be moving people and providing more mobility and earning more revenue. So safe, secure, and sheltered bike parking needs to be a part of the solution as we encourage more people to bike to the train. We also need to look at the opportunities to partner with our bike sharing systems, which you know have been experienced from experiencing tremendous growth over the past few years and their role in the mobility landscape continue to evolve as we navigate the pandemic. But ensuring that we, we draw the bike sharing into the world of the allied modes will require um, work both in terms of the coordinated fares and ticketing, and especially in terms of building that safe infrastructure required to really encourage people to bike and walk to, to rail and transit. Next slide. So when I first started working with our uh, internal active transportation partners, many of whom you've heard about in the last few days at this uh, symposium, uh, one thing that kept coming up, a question we always got asked was like, how do you fund these first and last mile projects? Often uh, they're beyond the scope of transit funding sources and are not identified as priorities in active transportation funding sources. And there's just this gap. So we've been working together to enhance the language in various funding sources that we manage and administer so that agencies applying for active transportation funding are looking at the opportunities to also connect to transit. Uh, one of the funding programs that our division works closely with is the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, which is funded through Greenhouse Gas Reduction Funds and SB1 funding, and has previously limited applicants to projects containing only rail and transit elements. However, we've um, updated the criteria to include bike and pedestrian projects if they connect to and enhance the access uh, for rail and transit in the project application. And we are excited that we've been able to award a few projects like this already that will actually deliver um, on the ground active transportation improvements alongside their rail and transit projects. So, you know, we plan to continue enhancing these connections to uh, better leverage our funding and deliver these integrated projects that connect to the broader rail and transit networks for local communities. And then lastly, in addition to the, the first and last mile connectivity, there are other types of active transportation and transit projects that we're working on to better integrate, um, including bike parking at stations, integrating payment options, and rails with trails projects. So I'm going to pass it off to Henry now, who's going to talk more about station access and walk through some specific examples of this work. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so Shannon mentioned funding programs such as the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, or TIRCP, um, although not focused entirely on active transportation, um, can actually be leveraged for active transportation projects under the right circumstances um, when they help you know, integrate the state rail and transit networks um, and increase transit ridership. Um, and so Valley Rail is a great example of this and is a TERSET project that I'm gonna talk about. Um, in 2018, the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission was given a large TIRCP award for their Valley Rail project. Um, so Valley Rail is a project that will expand the Altamont Corridor Express or ACE service to Sacramento from Stockton, um, as well as down to Merced, um, better connecting the Central Valley to the Sacramento region and Bay Area. So um, the project includes several new stations, um, including the planned Midtown station in Midtown Sacramento. Um, shown in this rendering. 
Um, in this case, TIRCP funds are being used to construct two separated bicycle lanes in Midtown Sacramento, um, which will help connect the station to the surrounding areas and provide better non-motorized access. Um, so we can also use this specific Valley Rail project, which keep in mind is a much you know, larger project um, for new, new rail stations and rail infrastructure as a case study for how we can look at the intersection between active transportation projects and rail and transit projects, especially in a first last mile context um, and how these you know, funding for rail and transit can be used for active transportation. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about station access, um, which is a fairly broad topic. Um, but when analyzing station accessibility, um, it's important to look at both local transit and bicycle pedestrian networks. Um, is together they form, you know, the multimodal network, which is really what we're concerned with. Um, so in certain cases, active transportation can create an important link between rail stations and local transit um, and other key destinations in an urban environment. So. This animation is fairly simple and just shows access um, via a combination of both public transportation, Sacramento Regional Transit, um, and just pedestrian and bike accessible networks um, from each of the planned Valley Rail stations in Sacramento. Um, and just the way to interpret this map is the lighter blue um, is you know, short travel times, areas that you can get to in you know, five, five minutes, um, where the darker blue are longer travel times. So you're seeing you know, the travel time to get further via walking and public transportation decrease as you get farther typically. Um, and just going through this, you can see that the plan, you know, City College Station is located on the same platform as existing SAC RT light rail service. Um, so it has really good, you know, access in the southern, southern part of the city with transit and walking. Um, but as you get north into the Midtown Station, although it's not, you know, directly, you know, on the same platform as light rail, it's next to light rail and bus um, and is very walkable. Um, and so there's sort of the most overall access to you know, the whole city and region. Um, as we get north, um, the, old plan the planned old North Sacramento station um, actually has pretty good light rail and bus connections and some decent walkability. Um, so there's decent access as well, although not quite as much as Midtown. Um, however, as we get all the way north um, where there's to the, um, the Thomas Airport Station, there isn't really direct bus access and the walkability is somewhat limited. Um, so you can see the access really cuts off here a lot. Um, it's important to note that this is an airport connection station. There will be a bus um, connection for this purpose, um, but this just sort of shows the difference with, you know, the availability of the existing transit um, and pedestrian and bicycle networks and how that sort of looks visually. Um, so I'm going to talk about more specifically some of the on the ground features of the planned Midtown station in terms of, you know, uh, first and last mile planning and accessibility. So if we look at the planned Midtown station, um, it's, you know, one of the planned Valley Rail stations and will be located in Midtown Sacramento um, on Q Street between 19th and 20th streets. Um, the station will serve connections to the Central Valley and Bay Area um, and is highly important to the um, state's future passenger rail service goals as identified in the 2022 California State Rail Plan, which Shannon and I have been working on. Um, the Midtown Station is also an interesting case study in how rail stations can be integrated with local transit and how active transportation planning plays an important role in this process. Um, so this station is located between 16th, the 16th, and the 23rd Street light rail stations, um, which provide regional transit connections to the, the region, um, as well as several bus stops. Um, so part of this, these connections, importantly, include connections to the Sacramento Valley Rail Station, which has you know, existing Amtrak rail service and bus service, um, which is a 19 minute walk slash light rail ride away. Um, Um, and it's also this this station can be accessed, you know, through the 16th Street light rail station, which I showed, um, as well as the 23rd Street light rail station, um, which is also an eight mile walk in the other direction. Um, an important thing to note here is that the state rail plan identifies a future track connection enabling service transfers between Valley Rail trains um, and existing trans, uh, Amtrak trains in the long term. Um, but that's that's a long term like 2050 goal. And so in the near term, the rail plan identifies, you know, these light rail connections from the planned Midtown station is the way to um, make those connections. Um, 
Next, I'm going to talk about um, specifically the bike lanes that are going to be added as part of this project um, and the sort of purpose they serve. Um, so here we can see Sacramento's bicycle infrastructure uh, network is currently fairly strong in Midtown and the downtown areas. Um, but the network of protected bicycle lanes is kind of disconnected. So the existing protected bike lanes are shown on this map in dark and light blue thick lines. Um, so part of Valley Rail's TRCP grant is being used to fund two buffered bicycle lanes on 19th and 21st streets um, between Broadway um, and H streets, shown in red here. These new bicycle facilities will substantively increase the protected bicycle network in the city. However, there is currently still you know, gaps in the network. So once we bring in um, other planned projects um, that are protected bicycle lanes in the city, we can see that this sort of fills this gap, um, creating a pretty robust connected network um, in Sacramento. Um, and now we can sort of look at other things we like to look at, um, such as population density. We can see that this um, built out network does a fairly good job of connecting the higher density residential areas to one another um, and to the rest of the city. We can also look at you know, other things such as job density um, and see that uh, the network connects you know, the higher re density residential areas with some of the higher density um, job areas, um, which is sort of the goal with some of this stuff. So we sort of just discussed um, how we, you know, look at some of these projects from a state perspective, um, specifically in the context of, you know, funding, you know, rail and transit projects. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Joanne Parker from SMART, who is a local transit, um, a local rail and transit partner, who will be discussing uh, rails with trails projects um, and really talking about some of the stuff from more of the perspective of, of a local agency. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Hi, everybody. Joanne Parker. Um, I work with the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District, and I've been here about um, 11 or 12 years. We're kind of a unique project. Um, we have we incorporate a lot of elements that have been talked about in the last presentation. Uh, and specifically, we are building a fully integrated bicycle and rail um, network with the, the idea of shifting modes and, and, uh, um, in, and actively engaging our community in behavior modifications for climate benefit with bikes being the short, uh, use being prioritized for short trips and our commuter rail system being prioritized for your longer corridor trips. And I can't get my slide to go forward. So hold on one second. There we go. I'll try that. Uh, to orient you, uh, our corridor is along the Marin and Sonoma counties. Uh, this is a state map of the north that has highlighted in red the North Bay. Uh, our counties are the two coastal counties in this picture. Combined, they're twice the size of Rhode Island. For those who are familiar with California, that's not a surprise. But when we talk to people about our corridor from back east, they seem kind of shocked that the, the, the magnitude and scale of what California's mobility challenge is. We're a mix of urban, suburban, and rural. We do have the fifth largest city in the Bay Area located within our, our service corridor. That also is surprising for some people, Santa Rosa being the fifth largest. But we combine that with a mix of fairly small and uh, uh, communities that are separated by uh, urban growth boundaries and agricultural, um, largely ag agricultural areas. So we do have some of the most rural parts of the Bay Area in our corridor as well. People think of us as wine country, um, you know, everybody comes here for a, a, a relaxing time. So they don't tend to see, um, in, in a lot of vacation destinations, you don't tend to see the, the, the community as a whole. Our district does have some interesting um, components to it. Um, we're, we're about 23% Hispanic, Latinx, and approximately 19% low income, which is 200% of the federal poverty line. That is um, actually our ridership on board our trains is, about, is higher than our community as a whole in terms of low income riders at about 26%. And uh, we are home in Sonoma County to all of the Bay Area's uh, federally recognized tribal nations. We have six of them located here. The Smart Corridor, there's a map there on the right. Um, rail service began here in the North Bay in the 1800s. So a lot of our communities 
that are older were developed around uh, a rail service and they tend to have smaller um, more transit oriented smaller lot sizes more transit oriented land use and tend to create more walkable communities um, that changed in the 1950s era uh, as did a lot of our state and country with auto oriented development um, and uh, we have not had passenger rail service in the north bay in 60 years before smart started so we were the last major uh, highway corridor in the Bay Area to see a fixed guideway service. And for those of you who have ever experienced Highway 101, <laughs> which is the only way you can commute between the counties uh, and into the San Francisco area, it is quite a slog. Um, we've owned the public, we, the public have owned the right of way since the 1980s and 90s. And there were a series of efforts to um, create a funding source for a rail service along the corridor. In 2008, there was a voter approved sales tax across the two counties with over 70% 70 70 approval. It's a quarter cent sales tax and it is our primary fund source, particularly for operations, but also for some directed capital investment. We, it didn't, it, it our, our vote at 2008, for those who recall back that far, uh, there's a lot that's happened since then, but, um, it was the beginning of the recession, so our sales tax did not co collect as much revenue as originally anticipated, and it resulted in a phased implementation of our overall 70-mile project that is uh, from Cloverdale to um, in the north to Larkspur in the south. We're comprised of passenger rail, um, an ancillary pathway for non-motorized trips, and we are a, now the public freight rail short line operator on the corridor. We opened for passenger service in August 2017. Again, that was uh, almost 60 years since previous passenger service on the corridor had existed. And we extended our 43 mile service, initial service to Larkspur and the Larkspur Ferry connection to the San Francisco and to San Francisco in 2019. So right now we're a 12 station, 45 mile system. Uh, the pathway. It's part of our railroad system. It's it's um, it's so far we've constructed an open 24 miles with our partners constructing some segments and smart constructing others. We also have another 14 and a half miles funded for construction. If you all are in the area on Saturday, October 30th, the most the the newest section of the smart pathway, um, which is also called the Foss, Foss Creek pathway locally in Healdsburg will be open. It connects downtown. Um, Healdsburg to their community center on the north side, and there'll be a there'll be a big party uh, with lots of games for kids, and hopefully a few costumes. Um, and you're welcome to come, uh, and that'll be this Saturday at at uh, noon. Right now, tw ten of our <clears throat> excuse me, twelve stations have completed pathway connections, and I just want to emphasize that. You know, it's a uh, it's viewed for us as a safety feature as well because. Uh, our communities are rural, as I mentioned, some of them, and so the really the only direct connection between them in terms of infrastructure is um, the railroad. So country roads tend to wander, they have elevation changes, they kind of go off to the east and the west before they get to the city that you're looking to get to. Um, and so people have been trespassing on the right of way for some time, and uh, we view the pathway as giving them a safe, legal, means of walking and biking between communities. Um, our, our project crosses through a number of jurisdictions, so there's a lot of coordination that needs to take place with local jurisdictions in terms of integrating within their street network. But we also have the um, California Public Utility Commission that is our, our, our railroad safety over, oversight entity in, um, that governs our grade crossing. So we do a lot of a consultation to make sure that what we're implementing is, uh, meets everybody's safety concerns. Um, as I mentioned, um, this, uh, there's a, the, the, the pathway that's opening this weekend is being um, also named this, the Great Redwood uh, Trail. It's the first section to open under the, the nomenclature of Great Redwood Trail Authority. The state has been a great partner in our system and has recently cre created the Great, Red, great Redwood Trail Authority for the um, the entire corridor from Moran up to Humboldt County and that agency that they've just created will also be working on implementing pathway uh, north of where we now own to the Sonoma Mendocino County line. 
Uh, we're not just a pathway though for first and last mile and local trips. We have tried to integrate bicycles on board our trains. We run um, up to three car train system or a diesel multiple unit system. And we have fully level boarding onto our cars and we can accommodate bicycles on board our trains right now. It's approximately 24 bikes per two, par, two car train set. Um, it depends on the mix of other riders on board and, that, and uh, the capacity. Uh, Pre-pandemic, about 11% of our riders were bringing their bicycles on board. Our ridership, like most public, agent, public transit agencies, dropped during COVID. Uh, but we, we um, did notice that uh, a, a new group of bicyclists were coming on board and about 20% of our riders during COVID brought their bikes on board. We do have bicycle storage at each of our stations and, and they're comprised of bike racks, but also bike link bike lockers. We tried to, from the get go, set up a system that could accommodate a wide range of concerns uh, in terms of security and integration, integration with the rest of the Bay Area's bike locker systems. And our partners, the Sonoma County Transportation Authority and the Transportation Authority of Marin are launching a pilot program for bike share along our corridor. And it will have uh, bike share facilities located at every station from Santa Rosa South. I'll give you a few uh, illustrative examples of what it looks like to put a paved class one pathway within a railroad right of way. Um, we've got uh, um, the, the picture on the left is of the facility being built in Roner Park, adjacent to our Roner Park station while our railroad was being reconstructed. This is about 2016. Uh, also the pedestrian bridge that's being put in uh, in the upper right corners from that project as well. There's a number of creek crossings. So we have prefabricated pedestrian bridges or non-motorized bridges that we've installed along the corridor. We do help cross a lot of uh, obstacles. Like I mentioned, um, there's a couple of river crossings. There's um, a number of, of highway crossings. We are uh, woven in, um, in and along our corridor, Highway 101 and SMART um, cross over each other a number of times. And, and, the, and we are now providing access uh, to communities that were previously divided by either the railroad or the highway. Um, and that's an example of that in the lower right corner. Some more pictures. Um, we have a tunnel project that was built by local jurisdictions before we were an in, uh, operating railroad and uh, with our engineering oversight. And so this project connecting Larkspur and San Rafael is the middle picture. And we dedicated half of our tunnel to the rail facility and half to a, the class one facility. Um, I just want to speak for a moment about something that um, uh, is, is worth noting about the North Bay. It's been a rough four years where we are. Uh, since we started service in August 2017, we have had 12 uh, federal disasters declared in Sonoma County in the first three years of our service, including a number of fires, uh, several floods, and um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the October 2017 Tubbs fire was just two months into our service, less than two months into our service, resulted in over 6,000 houses being destroyed, homes being destroyed in our county. Uh, and we had to uh, re-experience that several times since then uh, with uh, campfire impacts from smoke, as well as the Kincaid fire in 2019 and the LNU complex fire in August 2020. So our community is, has had a, um, a, a lot of trauma um, overall, there's still a lot of shifting things going on. We're not really 100% sure what our what demographics or commute needs or anything we're going to settle on post pandemic, but we're trying to create options for people so that they can have more um, healthy choices and a stronger sense of, of, of community and um, Quite frankly, what we had mentioned, but what I heard mentioned in the previous panel, I, I was happy to hear it. it it's, it's about joy, too. And I think it's creating healthy options for people. Um, um, I, I want to take a moment to just mention that when we started service, rail service uh, in 2017, it for the first six months of our service, if you are on board our train, it was a deafening experience. People were communicating with each other and not necessarily with people they knew, with strangers. They were learning about each other's lives in a way they hadn't um, in probably 50 years since the last passenger rail service took, 
was operating along the corridor. It was it was delightful. It made you wonder how um, people can live for as long as they did without um, having this uh, connecting service um, for each other. So I, I want to emphasize a few lessons that we've learned in all of this. Um, we, for starters, um, you're, you're going to have you're going to need your community, all of them, even if you aren't getting along on a particular topic. Uh, you'll form non-traditional alliances. You have to. I mean, rail and and bicycling communities don't normally talk to each other. <laughs> I can attest to that. There's not necessarily a lot of trust between them. Um, but uh, I think that um, you just got to keep going, and um, you'll end up having some positive impacts at the end. You have to be relentless. Um, I think that our prior commenters talked about the different fund sources. SMART has benefited from probably dozens of different fund sources for the pathway alone, um, from different state, local, regional partners. We've used just about every fund source you can imagine. We're hoping for a few more coming forward. Transit Inner City Rail um, Capital Program has been one of them. So we are building a rail extension right now that includes pathway with it. And you have to remember when you get tired, because you will as, as staff people working on this, or if you're too abstracted from the outcome, you're, you've got to remember you're creating basic access and choice for working people and families and get out and, and talk to them. Um, you've got to ride trains. If you have a train, go ride it. It's great, especially if you're working on it. It reminds you um, why you're in the business. Get out on your bike. Talk to people who are riding bikes who you have who you wouldn't normally talk to, because of course we all have different bicyclist types in our community. And find the joy in all of it. Being on board our train reminds us all, um, and talking to our bicyclists on our on our pathway and on our trains reminds us all um, why we're doing this, and that we have actually saved marriages and extended careers and done all kinds of things where people just couldn't face driving the corridor anymore and now they have options. So I just want to remind everybody to go, get out and, and experience the systems that you're building. Um, I just had to share this. These are pre-pandemic, I admit, but there's a lot of kids out there who ride our trains and um, they're the reason we're doing this. And then there are people post-pandemic riding our trains. So don't be afraid, go out and experience your transit systems. We've carried a, a couple million riders during our first four years and our average trip length is about 24 miles on board the train alone. So we're very happy with how our service has started and the role we have made for ourselves in our community. And with that, uh, we're gonna shift now to this, to Southern California where Paul Martin is gonna pick up the next presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks Joanne. So then uh, let me go ahead and get this going, screen share. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Martin. I work at Mark Thomas. Hit the button. All right, I think we're good. Everyone can see that, right? Excellent, thanks Shannon. So then, Again, I'm Paul Martin. I work at Mark Thomas, and uh, I'm going to build on this kind of discussion of alliances and allies uh, between the modes and between the agencies. So in mine, I'm going to focus on some case studies of regional efforts by regional transportation planning agencies in Southern California. So starting with the Orange County uh, Transportation Authority, they did a Metrolink access study um, in 2013. And it, it's got some years on it at this point, but really what I wanted to highlight is this planning document and some of the others were foundational in catalyzing some of these improvements on access to transit stations. So the OCTA study evaluated the 11 fixed rail transit stations, really identified opportunities for improving those access uh, along those corridors. And we do see a lot of progress and success. So Shown here is a photograph of a trail that is connecting the Laguna Niguel Mission Viejo train station in southern Orange County along a creek. And, you know, some of these things, I feel like it's easier said than done when we think about all the parties involved with this. Here we have the Orange County Flood Agency, the local jurisdictions, and some private development shown in the upper right, uh, all coming together to really make these things happen with the local jurisdiction and OCTA involvement as well. That planning study from years ago provided a baseline uh, evaluating the access for both bicycle and pedestrian access. And that type of thing could be evaluated over time uh, if desired. 
OCTA has moved forward with um, evaluating high ridership train uh, bus stop locations. So this is a Caltrans funded grant that was just secured. So the, the work is about to begin and it will focus on the 41 highest ridership bus stops within the county. So the image on the upper right shows the disadvantaged communities based on the, the state designations, uh, the Cal and Bio screen and the income levels. Uh, and then the, the yellow halos are around each of those 41 uh, bus stops, the highest ridership locations. It is no coincidence that most of those locations are serving disadvantaged communities. Maybe one of those is not, and that's near a, a large regional mall, South Coast Plaza. Uh, so again, you see OCTA in this case, the regional planning agency, transportation planning agency looking at how improvements could be made in local agencies moving forward in uh, making those projects happen. Similar work was done in San Bernardino. At the time it was named Sandbag, but now the agency is going as SBCTA, the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. So the team there evaluated six fixed rail stations and four BRT stations. You start to see some similarities uh, at that time identifying a long list of locations. And you see the image here with the catchment area in the image in the center based on walking access within a certain time frame, all within that half mile buffer. There's a bigger black circle around that. And in that document, identifying what are the types of improvements that could be implemented. SBCTA and those local agencies have moved forward uh, with multiple awards. So um, APA National Planning Award, but also funding awards. So ATP cycle one and cycle four. In this case, the implementation has been advanced by SBCTA with those local agencies, which I'm sure is no small feat trying to work it out with each jurisdiction and make sure that the design standards are applicable for customized for each of those agencies. And then in Los Angeles, there's been multiple uh, efforts and studies and documents that LA Metro has provided. Uh, there was first the first last mile strategic plan shown on the right that really established that process. It said, how do we evaluate and prioritize station improvements, uh, site access improvements, and really set the, the baseline for those guidelines. That document actually defined this idea of the pathway, and you heard that term pathway being used by Joanne um, with the, the same idea here. How, how can we define a path in this case that leads to those transit stations? And seamless, some of these words are showing up in all our slides, seamless uh, allies and alliances and access to those transit sheds. Uh, the images on the bottom right really show that policy idea of uh, a buffer distance within some radius of the transit stop that you have strong access, whether you're walking or cycling. And the reality is that there's some barriers. So the image in the center uh, shows the catchment area is more limited based on the barriers. And the LA Metro document identified the pathway to help really expand the, the reach and fully achieve the policy perspective of access based on uh, a radial distance from each of those transit stops. LA Metro has moved forward with a lot of planning work for various rail lines, but also more recently updated their guidelines and looked at who does what and really defined the roles by the local agencies in LA Metro. And then uh, in keeping with current industry practice, realized that they really need the transportation to align with other things. So whether it's um, alignment with transit oriented communities uh, and policies for infill, really addressing our housing needs throughout the state, or looking at how they can institutionalize partnerships with community-based organizations, CBOs. So the image on the right is actually from one of the, the studies on the blue line or the A line as it's being named now. I'm always just gonna call it the blue line, I guess. Uh, and it lists out the various partners and CBOs that were involved. So LA Metro has fully embraced this concept and it's been incorporated into the consultant planning efforts to really include various groups such as the Bicycle Coalition, but also um, the, the listed groups there, such as Ride On or the Eastside Riders, 
really um, you know, bridging the gap between the planners doing work in a jurisdiction and, and really getting a stronger voice and participation by local community members and really making sure that things aren't missed and there's stronger ownership and buy-in from the community. So with all those uh, discussion of alliances and allies, I wanna hand it off to Destiny Thomas, Dr. Destiny Thomas, to uh, bring, it, bring it home for us. So with that, doctor. Thank you very much. All right, so to bring it on home, <laughs> as it was stated, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, something that we often forget to consider in our transportation planning efforts. Um, there is a connection between active transportation planning and access to housing. So I wanna share some of the lessons that I've learned while working as a transportation planner that cares a whole lot about access to dignified housing. So this, comp this uh, link between transportation and housing is really complex. There are uh, some obvious things, right? Like the history of transportation planning in the United States, but especially and in including in California. We know about redlining, but we haven't talked enough about the impact that just our general conversations about <clears throat> the potential of high-speed rail has had on the housing market in the state of California. Um, we've also seen an uptick in racist vigilanteism um, in all modes of travel, and we've seen an increase in gender-based violence and policing in those spaces as well. Another way this connection is really complex is we often uh, do our work in a web of contradictions. Our equity programs are often defining poverty, like with the Calvin viral screen, as a lack of access to a car, right? We, and sometimes we measure poverty based on whether or not a household has access to a car. Meanwhile, we also have this notion of walkability um, that the real estate market relies heavily on, which is inherently biased and can be manipulated to either reproduce the racist and classist notions that are used to justify the disinvestment that many of our communities are already facing, or they use this notion to overstate the accessibilities and amenities in a community to promote housing speculation and increase the, the value of the real estate in the community. Uh, some of those amenities um, that they usually speak to are, you know, bike facilities, access to transit and walkable sidewalks. Another way this relationship has become increasingly complicated is that we've simply been kicking the can for decades. Our ability to reconcile structural crises at the community level uh, continues to be continues to contribute to development induced displacement, our inability. We don't want to have conversations about racism. We don't want to spend uh, substantial resources on community engagement and funding CBOs to, to the degree that is necessary in order to have the outcomes that we desire. And so what we end up with um, are uh, uh, transit systems that are bleeding ridership, bicycle facilities that are subpar, and many, many, many black and brown and low wealth communities without access to basic amenities like sidewalks and crosswalks. The next complex dynamic that we're dealing with here is just a general lack of focus. Our active transportation programs fail to answer some basic questions, one of which is, who are we connecting? and what are we connecting them to? We hear terminology like first, last mile. Uh, we know we wanna get you know, to the point where we have 15 minute cities, get there quickly, get there cheap, um, but we're not having enough conversation about who and connect to what. Um, lastly, or the last um, complicated connection that I'll speak to today is that we are often doing our work with the transportation first attitude. We've politicized the notion of active transportation. You're either for bikes or for cars. And this has led to a very inefficient campaign for centering housing around our preferred modes, as opposed to adopting our notion of mobility to be responsive to the latent potential of dignified and affordable housing solutions. Simply put, what would it look like 
if we as a field were to establish a housing first approach to our transportation planning, as opposed to asking uh, housing to adapt to what we saw in the first presentation is several centuries old um, transportation network that was built by the hands of slaves and indentured servants. So what we're really wrestling here with today is active housing versus active transportation. As I mentioned, I wanna share some of the lessons that I've learned in my tenure as a transportation planner in the state of California. One of my most uh, recent and notable uh, tenures or positions was my role with the Vision Zero Department or in uh, LADOT. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen are images of a house that is currently on sale for $465,000 in uh, the, a zip code within Los Angeles that is um, currently receiving an influx of uh, active transportation infrastructure investments. This home is only 716 square feet and it has two bedrooms. Anyone who's ever lived in a studio knows that this is not enough square footage for zero bedrooms, let alone two. But what I want you to pay attention to is that in 2014, this home was only worth $174,000. Vision Zero was um, signed into policy as an executive order in the city of Los Angeles in 2015. It took about a year to determine what the uh, implementation of that would look like. And what we found was that shortly thereafter, soon as we announced what our high injury network would be in, in uh, Los Angeles, we saw speculation start to bubble up and the cost of living start to increase along our transportation investments. Now, I know many of you are saying, Destiny, how can you prove that there is truly a connection between our active transportation work and the cost of living? So I took the liberty of capturing a Google Drive. Um, this one is uh, in the 90003 zip code, right along a corridor that began to receive um, discussion about active transportation investments in 2017. This is where this house is located, by the way. This is the, um, the priority corridor nearest it. And then you see right when we got to 2017, with the implementation of very basic active transportation interventions, we saw an influx in the cost of living in the community. Another thing that's problematic about this is in predominantly black and brown communities where we're seeing this dynamic bubble up. We're putting um, very low quality materials into the roadway, doing very short term and temporary planning. But the impacts of this, again, are having long term effects on our ability to access dignified housing. I also learned many lessons while working on the Watts Rising project, which is a project that's a part of the transformative climate communities uh, funding mechanism. This is in the 90059 zip code, which is pretty much really deep south, really deep uh, south central LA, actually not south central, this is Watts. Um, similarly, you're looking at, I know it looks like you're looking at just a sidewalk with dumping, but this is a four bedroom house that in 2009 sold for $160,000. Today, this, this house is on the market for $650,000. Now, given the lessons that I learned from housing speculation in my earlier days working with Vision Zero, it made sense for me to do an analysis of um, the, the risk for displacement. One, we were required to, but two, this was really important to me. Um, I, I wanted to test the perceptions of displacement or the likelihood that displacement would occur among residents because what's even more dangerous uh, then rapid gentrification because of our transportation investments is a community full of people who are low wealth, who don't know that this dynamic is about to unfold in their community. So we did a study um, where we actually, um, our focus community was Watts, but we had a control community, which was uh, the, the, the Figueroa community, 
uh, in North LA. The reason we did this study in two neighborhoods was because um, in, in the North Figueroa community, they had already experienced the type of gentrification and transformation that I anticipated experiencing in Watts. And so I wanted to be able to capture the oral histories of residents, if the residents who um, remain um, to see whether or not they themselves were able to see um, this dynamic coming before it happened. And what we found through that study was um, many of the residents who were able to stay in the North Figueroa community did not realize that them championing these improvements, these investments in the community would lead to the displacement of so many of their neighbors. Um, and But after the fact, they were able to draw very clear connections between their current quality of life um, and the rent burden that they've experienced uh, and the investments that came into the community. What we found was that the responses of Watts residents who we interviewed to ask how they felt about these improvements and whether or not they felt they were at risk for displacement was that their responses uh, really aligned with what the North Fig community said their perceptions were before the investments came. We know in our field, in our state, and in this city that this connection between transportation planning and displacement exists. We know it. Um, but we continue to we continue to do business as usual in our transportation planning efforts, right? So here are a couple of headlines that we've seen come out of um, new recent publications. Um, a lot of people are scared of the investments at this point because they know that gentrification is ruining lives. Um, but on the same day, we see another article that's discussing the expansion of transit. Uh, for the sake of improving access to an eventual sports complex. So I want us to revisit the notion of connectivity, right? Earlier I asked the question of connecting who and connecting them to what. And I think what we're missing here, one is a housing first solution as well as a people-centered solution, okay? So um, I've been able to take all of those lessons now as a business owner at the Thrivance Group and, and apply those to our work on another TCC project that's located in Central California in the city of Fresno. What they were able to do on that project was anchor all of the project elements to an anti-displacement priority um, by way of our leadership as the anti-displacement lead consultant. Um, we are able to direct the city to invest in a customized strategy for preventing and repairing uh, the displacement that's already occurred or displacement that could occur <clears throat> based on what we now understand about the connection between transportation investments um, and housing instability. We were able to get to some of these solutions through a combination of participatory planning and participatory policy design um, and develop some radical approaches to equity instead of what I refer to as toxic diplomacy. So what that product looked like um, for the city of Fresno is that we actually generated a, a blueprint for anti-displacement planning, which included 46 policy recommendations for the city of Fresno that, that then went through uh, what we call the here to stay public comment process. And as you see, one of the focus areas that we asked residents to, to really think about in their response to the policies we were recommending was transportation. We also wanted to make sure that our approach had a racially just analysis. And so what you're seeing on the screen now is that there were stark differences in terms of policy preferences regarding housing stability adjacent these transportation investments, um, depending on what race you were. Um, what's challenging about this dynamic and what this means is if the city is populated, majority populated by white folks who really love bicycles and don't have a personal or emotional connection to what it's like to be displaced. And if we just go by majority vote, um, we will continue to be kicking the can down the road and have policies that don't serve us all. So we took the lessons learned from that project and applied them to a housing project that includes transporta active transportation investments as opposed to an active transportation project that includes 
housing investments. And what we were able to do here was name, understand, and build a strategy around these relationships, activate this housing first concept, build new partnerships, and strive for 100% <clears throat> community ownership of the final product. So this community in Fresno is getting uh, uh, about 400 affordable housing units. We conducted what I call a community engagement equity gaps analysis, where we took every single public comment that we could find, put it into buckets and categories, called those categories focus areas, name what the current state of being was for the focus area, what we wanted our desired state to be, and what the community engagement action steps should be in order to achieve that desired state. And so we have this tool that we use at the Thrivance Group, our decision engagement decision-making tool that allows us to plug all of those responses into an actual community engagement plan. A lot of people think community engagement is just educating the community about what you wanna do in really fun ways, but it should actually be tied to human-centered desired outcomes. So to wrap up my presentation today, I wanna to share with you a litmus test that we use at the Thrivance Group for reparative planning, right? Planning that serves as reparations for how harmful our work has been in the transportation planning se sector. There are four elements to this litmus test. The policy or program or project on its own or in combination with another, has to address a specific element of harm that's been identified by residents themselves and through research. The second element is that the policy or program or project um, or, or its implementation plan has to strive to identify a specific and intentional recipient of an issue specific direct intervention. What we mean is if we're naming who, who has been harmed, then that person or community that's been harmed deserves a very intentional intervention that addresses that specific harm. The third ele element is that whatever the eligibility or qualifying factor for this project or program is, cannot pose an additional burden or barrier that would contribute to new or additional displacement. So asking people to prove that they're poor asking people to prove that they used to live there doesn't do anything but create an additional uh, burden. So as well-meaning as it is, it doesn't meet our litmus test for reparative planning. The last thing is that the program project or policy and the people who implement them have to have the intention of creating a permanent redress for the impacts of past harmful planning practices. It's an insult to our communities to suggest that a temporary pop-up project or temporary um, bollards and vertical elements that um, become waste and trash in the roadway four months later is somehow a solution to what we are now acknowledging is several hundred years of racist um, housing and transportation planning dynamics. Thank you very much. I think this concludes our presentation and now we'll move into the question uh, and answer portion. Yes, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Wow, great presentations, really insightful, so informative. Um, just really appreciate that. So my name is Summer Lopez. I am a project manager through the Active Transportation Resource Center at Caltrans, and I will be facilitating our Q&A today. So the first question we have, and this is open to anyone, how do we overcome structural silos to institutionalize coordination between transit and active transportation? Okay, I'll jump in. I don't have the answer. Uh, I think just um, persistence is a good is a good trait to have, and continuing to I uh, return to the person. It's what Dr. Thomas said, and what my center is in the work I do. It's about the people that we're trying to serve, and if the community needs the um, the investment, then it helps uh, you. Um, direct your comments or your efforts at coordination in a more focused way. You have to keep it really personal and really human. And I will say the persistence is a really 
um, important trait to have uh, because I've been in the industry for a long time now and um, and nothing is different about how I work in my industry. I still work uh, in the same manner as I did 20 plus or maybe more years ago, <laughs> but the audience is different now and the national conversation and the statewide conversation is different now. So being persistent and continuing to focus your um, your energies on the intended benefit to the planet and to the people that we're serving is, is really helpful. Um, but I don't have like, there's no physical infrastructure in this. There are no silos to actually physically go and shake and break down. You have to do it in a people to people way. Uh, I guess I want to jump in too. I think, um, you know, inherently I'm not really shocked if an agency's focus on their transit plan, they're thinking about, you know, where do we run buses? How frequently do we run them? and focus on ridership. So I guess I would try and provide that nexus as much as possible about improved access to a transit station or a, a transit stop is only gonna mean a higher level of transit ridership is really gonna, that's kind of the, the money talks scenario for any transit planner or an agency trying to think about what their transit route system is gonna look like. Can I jump back in real quick? Um, this whole pandemic experience has changed the way we're all communicating with each other. And we're not sure how it's going to end at the end of the day, but it's also changed the way agencies and, um, and organizations are commuting with, communicating with each other. So uh, I think it, there might be some opportunities to take the, the best of what, if, if we did experience anything good during the pandemic, the best of how we've been able to communicate with each other, allowing more access to community meetings, of public public boards and so forth. So taking the communication tools and applying them to um, your goals is uh, is gonna be interesting as we continue to move forward from the pandemic, I think. Uh, and I'd like to add one more thing to that. I come from a social work background and one of the things that we do in social work, even especially in Los Angeles, is we use service planning area models, meaning even though my community that I'm working in is in one area of the county, um, I am working with folks in another area of the county who work in entirely dis different disciplines, right? So social workers are meeting with hospital staff who are also meeting with you know, the sex trafficking advocates who are also meeting with the fire department um, and, and there's, we're not getting caught up on whose discipline has a, a hierarchy over the other. And I think a lot of times what we see in these silos is this, this um, notion of meritocracy, right? If you're an engineer, you're better than a planner. If you're a planner, you're better than the intern. Um, and nobody is actually um, well-versed in what the community needs, right? So there's a lot to learn from our public health mental health and social work sectors in terms of breaking down silos. Love that. Thank you so much for all of your input. So the next question, uh, how are transportation agencies working with local planning departments and leaders to create more flexible zoning surrounding stations to encourage active transportation? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in, but I guess I'd be curious to hear Joanne from your group or others if there's something. I know I did the case study kind of highlighting the different agencies in Southern California. Um, I think traditionally we've seen a hesitancy on the transportation agencies of being perceived as telling an agency that they need to refine their land use plans or change their land use um, uh, and, and that kind of heavy hand perspective is doesn't play out very well when you've got multiple jurisdictions within a, a region. Um, I personally, I still think there's a mechanism to leverage that perspective and really encourage agencies, you know, like I talked about, whether it's station access for a higher transit ridership, it should be the same type of thing that we would look for increased density, whether it's jobs or housing around in infrastructure investments at transit stops. So whether it's a full station or a, a busy bus stop, uh, trying to find a way to bring those things together so that we do align the growth, whether it's housing or jobs with 
the investment in the transit system. So I think we've seen more activity in LA with LA Metro um, developing some of the sites around the transit stations, uh, but then some of the other agencies have just been much more singular focused on transportation solutions. I don't know um, how it is with SMART or some of the work in Sacramento County. Uh, I'll, I, I agree with you, Paul. It's uh, for our agency, we have a number, I mean, we're a long corridor, we're 70 miles across two giant counties. And um, the culture in one county is not the same as the culture in the other county when it comes to local control over their land use. And um, uh, so we do this delicate and we are voter funded. So we have to do this delicate dance with our local jurisdictions and also the community, um, some of whom are much more vocal than others. I won't name names. Um, but um, And then we have our region, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and, and Association of Bay Area Governments, as well as the state, who have strong uh, um, land, land use, housing, greenhouse gas reduction desires. And so there's this three-way dance um, between all of us. So we, and, and, in, and we are a, a new agency, so we are fragile in a lot of ways. Um, so we are very cautious about, again, prescribing, as you said, how a local jurisdiction should be um, approaching its land use and housing provision. I, I will say that the, the carrot is gonna work better for us than the stick. Um, you know, a lot of, and, and, I, and we've had circumstances that have driven our conversation quite a bit. Each jurisdiction along our corridor has been offered money from the MPO to do stationary plans that are supposed to reorganize their local land use conversation around our arrival in 2017. And then the um, tragedies of the fires and that, and we many of our communities were already at a zero a functional zero um, occupancy rate. Um, so there was already tons of housing pressure and we have the addition of, of uh, second home ownership in vast quantities in our area that again takes from the housing market. And I will add the cannabis land use issues. We had a lot of uh, housing that had been displaced for cannabis growing, illegal cannabis growing before the um, uh, before that law changed the conversation. So, um, uh, but the fires in particular really changed the conversation and there's a, and people want housing in, in Sonoma County now. There's just no question about it. And so we're the carrot in a way. A lot of developers won't talk about investing in development unless you have the fixed guideway system to, in theory, provide the amenities for better or for worse um, that make that uh, housing uh, uh, attractive, the, the production of the housing attractive to the parties who want to invest in it. And so particularly in the north of our corridor, everyone's signed on that we, we've we already suffered from the displacement and the, um, the negatives of being in a, um, in a desirable uh, second home market. And so we are, are some of our local ju jurisdictions are really embracing us and, and we try to support them in that, in, in giving them uh, data and other you know, service support so that they can, um, advance their housing development. A couple of our jurisdictions are absolute stars in just production, housing production right now. So they're, we're, we're promoting them, essentially. I want to add something really quick to this conversation. I know I don't work at an agency, but one of the policies we recommended through our Here to Stay report was an automatic anti-displacement zone that would be situated on and around new active transportation um, transit development in the city, which would incentivize, incentivize socially responsible develop, developers based on the metrics that were created by the community. And it would also um, allow the city to plan more intentionally around transit and connecting people to uh, people who are low wealth to um, the needed quality of life um, destinations not to monopolize, but I just add, we, we've partnered with a number of uh, uh, affordable housing developers recently in the last two cycles of the uh, statewide competition for the affordable housing sustainable community funds. So that's another way we try to incentivize um, both uh, creating affordable housing, but just uh, changing uh, towards a more transit oriented land use around our stations. We're active partners in 
um, a couple of proposals along the corridor and I get calls every day from other jurisdictions and other developers that want to do it in a number of locations. So we take that tact. You both just kind of answered the next question I was going to ask about recommendations around how to provide housing that people can afford while also improving up the transportation and connections to transit. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that question. If not, I can move on to the next question. I think we're good. All right. So the next one, um, let's see, this one has, oops. All right, here we go. So with California's continued growth, how is Caltrans planning to grapple with the need for right of way to accomplish reliable inner city travel in an integrated network that includes both slower local or freight and faster high speed rail or rapid bus options? Yeah, I can jump in here and I'll make a first a shameless plug that the 2022 California State Rail Plan will be live for public review in about a month and we would really love everyone to read that and provide comments to help make it better, but it will hopefully answer a lot of those questions. Basically, um, like I was saying in my presentation, a lot of our existing rights of way are actually very underutilized and so one way to be more strategic and um, a better steward of the public dollar is to really be uh, thinking more about the performance characteristics of our services, who, you know, what types of markets are we serving rather than kind of commute oriented services. Can we provide these all day bi-directional services that actually also help to run a railroad more efficiently? Uh, so that's one big principle of the rail plan is actually just trying to better manage the existing rights of way we do have. And we have really strong partnerships with both Union Pacific and BNSF Railway who are the private freight operators who own a lot of the, the railroad infrastructure in California. And so it is a, a necessary dance to have to coordinate with them. Um, and then obviously in corridors like SMART or Caltrain that are actually in the public right public ownership, we have a lot more flexibility to really be uh, rethinking services and utilization of the corridor to better serve more people. Um, and then with inner city bus, um, we're we're trying to enhance those opportunities as well. And some of those things are things that are on Caltrans right away that we can do more easily like uh, dedicated um, transit lanes or signal priority and things like that. But again, it's really looking at where are the markets, um, how can we connect people in more rural or uh, low density areas across the state and bring them into these uh, core services and making sure that the connections are timed easily and seamlessly so you're not waiting around at a transit station for hours or something like that. Again, that brings up safety and security risks. And so making sure that we're helping to really um, use what we have better first. And then I think from there, obviously there are some bigger uh, projects and capital investments that we will need to make. And so making sure that we're strategically building up into that service and adding additional tracks or passing sidings or station improvements as needed, um, rather than you know just like building a whole new rail system, which is um, prohibitively expensive at this point, right? So hopefully that answers the question. I know we're also out of time, but again, I will put a link for the rail plan website. We would really love your feedback and participation when that goes live. We actually have just a few more minutes that we can continue asking, answering a few more questions. This one's a bit long. It has kind of two parts to it. The first asks regarding regional coordination. Do you think that having fragmented transportation governance such as 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area is an issue? Does it make the system confusing, less attractive for riders who plan to transfer? Uh, between systems. So that's the first part. And then the second part is what measures apart from the clipper card um, or just in general, maybe what measures in California are we implementing to have a seamless system? And can we also integrate bike and ride sharing with some type of clipper card uh, service for first and last mile connectivity? So that's a lot. Let me know if you need me to repeat any of it. I'll jump in and speak to at least a statewide effort, but would love others to obviously provide their input. One of the initiatives that we're working on that kind of grew out of our last rail plan is the California Integrated Travel Program. And it has three components. And the first is around trip planning. So around the data side of it and working with the partners, especially a lot of the smaller and more rural partners that have limited resources to get them onto the general transit feed specification or GTFS so that at least their, their published schedules are added to something like Google Maps or a, an open open data platform for everyone to access and eventually getting that so that all of our systems would have the real time transit updated um, times in your in your map so that you can make uh, you know better decisions about planning a trip um, that maybe don't involve a car or only involve a car for a portion of that. 
And the second piece is around the payment question. And so what we're really trying to move towards is an open loop payment system. And without getting into the whole banking world of this, it's basically all of our kind of regional systems like the Connect card or the Tap card or the Clipper card operate in this closed loop system, meaning you can add cash, you can add other values, but once you put it onto your Clipper card, it can only be used in the Clipper system for transit. Um, and so this also makes it so that you, you, know, you can't go to Safeway and buy something with that money. By shifting to an open loop payment, it would mean that you can really just pay using the good old fashioned money in your wallet. Um, and so we would still you know, want to have the option to load cash onto a, a tap to pay system, but you could also use any tap to pay card that already exists in your wallet or mobile wallet or anything like that so that you are um, able to access transit, but not necessarily hold your transit money up in your, your regional specific card. And that would also allow you to tap seamlessly across an entire network. And a benefit of open loop is, um, you know, you, you still can add those fair policy uh, interventions to this. So you could still have fair capping. So if people are paying trip by trip, when they get to the daily cap, they would stop paying if they get to a monthly cap. And so this also helps for folks who maybe can't make the investment of a, a daily pass or a monthly pass up front, not be penalized for having, um, you know, not having the resources to do that. And then another component on the equity side is really just trying to streamline the eligibility verification. Um, for all 27 of those transit agencies in the Bay Area, there are different ways to prove that you are a youth or a veteran or a low-income rider or a, someone else who's very eligible for benefits. And it gets confusing and hard and you often have to go wait in line in person to, to get those benefits and then prove them to a bus driver. And it's a really convoluted system. And so with Cal ATP, we're really hoping to streamline that through like a one-stop shop at the statewide level that would just be like, yep, you are eligible for discounted rides based on whatever verification. And it makes it a lot easier for the, um, the bus driver or the, or the train driver as well to not have to know every little thing to verify, you just tap to pay it automatically processes your verification and everyone can move forward. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. And we're working with the local and regional agencies to start rolling that out. There are elements of this pilot live in Monterey Salinas Transit, as well as Sac RT Light Rail. And Henry just dropped a link in the chat. I encourage you to check out more on that as well. Can I jump in about the Bay Area real quick? <laughs> um, yes, of course, having multiple systems is uh, a little bit confusing. But I will say that um, as one of the newer systems in the Bay Area, some of the comments I've gotten is why, why another system? Nobody was creating this service that actually has a, um, a demand for it. And um, so sometimes you have to create a new system in order to, set, to serve the customers that want it. At the end of the day, we, we've benefited from not having legacy systems to create. So we did start with Clipper only. Um, and we have a lot of very uniform policies across our local bus operators. I do think some degree of coordination or consoli additional consolidation would be good in terms of the customers understanding the system. But at the end of the day, their biggest concern is sufficient service levels, reliable service levels, safe service levels, effective service levels. So if you don't offer enough service, people won't try you. It doesn't matter how many other fair policies you have or branding programs you're, you're um, putting in place. And there are some communities in the Bay Area that have been underserved, uh, uh, really underserved. I'll just say that Sonoma County, the bus systems up here, they, 80% of their, of their riders are low income, 80%. Um, and there's huge distances to, to um, travel over. So uh, having a fast and effective service um, for the existing riders and then it attracting everyone else who isn't able to use the system right now is really still the goal we're in. We haven't even built ourselves up to the level of the rest of the Bay Area to complain about how people aren't coordinated. We just don't have sufficient service levels yet. So um, uh, I, it's not the ultimate barrier, different agencies. The ultimate barrier is lack of service or ineffective service or underinvestment in transit. So that's my. Can I uh, just jump in real fast? I know Emily, you wanted to chat, but um, I, I want to call a timeout and just recognize Shannon and Caltrans. Frankly, typically I would be the last person to do this, but you know, the, the team at Caltrans is just rocking it lately. And to hear Shannon say, we recognize the interoperability and the, the lack of collaboration across transit agencies and 
we have an idea for that and we're moving forward on that like is just amazing to me so shannon you and the other staff at caltrans just keep doing it i encourage you to do that and to keep rocking it thanks Can I add something really quickly? Yeah. Um, I, I think as we think about um, improving connectivity and answering this question of, you know, how we manage mega region transit networks, um, I think we also have to think about um, not reproducing the environmental racism that a lot of these um, agencies and institutions are already contributing to. So thinking about not having all of the freight um, storage in black and brown communities not having all of the electrified bus storage depots in black and brown communities. Um, so like as we streamline things, I hope that we're not also streamlining the impacts of environmental racism. It's my only two cents on that. All right, we're officially out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists once again just for all of your great comments. This was an amazing conversation to end the day and the symposium with. And I am going to pass it over to Emily Abrahams to close us out. Thank you so much. And I'll just give a few closing remarks before we end, um, just about five minutes. So hang on a little longer for those um, still in attendance. Um, I just can't believe our, our three days is already over. Um, it's been such a blast and I hope you all have enjoyed the sessions as much as I have. I've learned so much. Um, again, I'm Emily Abrahams, a project manager for the Active Transportation Resource Center or ATRC at Caltrans in the Division of Local Assistance. Uh, before anyone signs off, um, we did want to populate our event survey in the chat box. So please do click on that link and take the brief survey as we really do want to hear your feedback so that we know what you liked um, and what we can continuously improve upon in the future. Uh, we'll also be emailing the survey link to all registered attendees as well. So please only take the survey once, but again, we really will appreciate your feedback. Um, as was stated in the opening remarks on day one, this has been our second active transportation symposium, but the first to be entirely virtual. Uh, we could not have pulled this off without the incredible support of our event coordination extraordinaires at Sacramento State College of Continuing Education. A big shout out to Tracy Cohen, Sherry Hagos, Nicole Donahue, and Julie Vinson. Um, you all are incredible and you've kept us on track. You've communicated all of the instructions to our speakers and our attendees. You've made these three days happen without any technical glitches. And seriously, that never happens. So it just speaks to how prepared you were and how much effort you put into the preparation of this. Um, I also want to thank the California Transportation Commission for their partnership on hosting this symposium with us. Uh, Lori Waters, Beverly Newman Burkhart, and Alika Changizi, um, and other commission staff, uh, thank you so much for helping us brainstorm the topics we wanted to feature and for putting your trust in the ATRC to make this happen. I also have to thank my colleague at Caltrans and co manager of the ATRC, Summer Lopez, for all her work um, to make this happen as well. She worked on so many of the details and was always there to step up when needed. And I am just so appreciative of her a lot. Just, I can't, I can't thank her enough. Um, of course, I also have to thank all of our featured speakers and keynote speakers on our panels and um, keynotes. It's because of them and their willingness to share their work and their insights with us that this event was able to happen. So I guarantee every single one of us have, has learned something new and I challenge all of the attendees to take these new thoughts and ideas back to our work and just strengthen our work and make it even better. Thank you so much to our opening remarks MCs, Jeannie Wardwaller, Caltrans Deputy Director of Planning and Modal Programs, CTC Chairwoman Hillary Norton and CTC Commissioner Carl Gordino. Thank you to our special featured guests, Caltrans Director Toksa Mashakin, CalSTA Secretary David Kim, Chairwoman Hillary Norton of the CTC, and Council Member Andre Gonzalez from the City of Bakersfield, and Chair of the State Transportation Assembly, Laura Friedman. Their video remarks each day were so meaningful, and we 
know they are dedicated to active transportation and it's just so inspiring to hear from them and know they are supportive in support of all this. Thank you to our virtual networking facilitators who really took a gamble on us and agreed to this crazy idea we had to allow peer-to-peer -peer discussion as part of this event um, while we are virtual. So I hope you are able to join. And for those of you who were able to join, I hope you did enjoy it. Um, please let us know your feedback in the survey. And lastly, thanks to all of you, our attendees, um, all of you who registered and set aside the time to listen and learn about active transportation from these brilliant speakers. Uh, we really appreciate your dedication to, to listen and learn through all, all these three days. So we hope to bring another symposium to you in October of 2023. Uh, we hope to hold these every other year. So stay tuned in two years for another. Um, again, please do take the survey and let us know your feedback. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope what you learn sticks and you will be driven to make these meaningful connections, visualize the future and transform it into reality. So with that, have a great week, have a great day and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Emily. Well done. Thank you all. Right. I'm going to end the session. So connect offline. Thank you so much. Thank you.